Welcome, everybody. I am Megan Golden, co-founder and co-director of Mission Cure, and I will MC this webinar this afternoon. Thank you very much for attending. This is the second Mission Cure webinar for patients and their families on pancreatitis, and there are just about 200 people registered. Before we start, I need to let you know that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Mission Cure website in, within the next day or two. Uh, today's webinar is listen only, but you can type your questions at any time into the Q&A box. Uh, it can be opened by clicking the Q&A icon on your screen at the bottom and uh, just open up the box, type your message and click send. And you can also use the Q&A box to let us know if you're having any technical problems and we'll help you out. So let's get started. Here's our agenda. After I tell you a little bit about Mission Cure, Dr. Whitcomb will then give us the big picture of how the traditional approach to treating pancreatitis needs to change and what we can hope for in the future. Then Dr. Haupt will delve into the details of which genetic mutations have been discovered to be associated with pancreatitis and what testing is available. And after that, we will have time for questions. And then finally, I'll tell you a little bit about how Mission Cure is using genetic discoveries to find treatments for people suffering from pancreatitis. And we plan, plan to end in an hour. So, in 2015, I was working for a nonprofit called the Institute for Child Success, leading a program that uses an innovative funding mechanism to increase funding for early childhood programs all across the United States. And there's been a big movement around the world really since 2011 to test innovative financing for early childhood and other social programs. During this time, my younger brother, Eric, who I think is on this webinar, uh, was diagnosed with chronic pancreatitis. As we searched unsuccessfully for a treatment to relieve his pain, we realized that the same financing could be potentially applied to cure his disease. We launched Mission Cure in 2017, and our mission is to develop effective therapies for chronic and recurrent acute pancreatitis within 10 years. And we were fortunate to have Linda Martin join us as co-director. Linda and I lead the organization together. You can see here our approach at Mission Cure, which we'll discuss more on our next webinar on December 8th. But today we're really focusing on the methods we're using to develop the effective treatments for pancreatitis, and that's kind of the square on the bottom right. So we have two polls during this webinar, and it's time for the first one. If, ooh, it's, I hope it's big enough for people to see. Uh, if you have chronic or recurrent acute pancreatitis, whether pediatric or adult, what type of pancreatitis have you been told that you have? And if you're a parent or a caregiver, you can respond uh, for the person that you care for. Um, the, and this information is going to help us understand what people listening to this webinar have been told is the cause of their pancreatitis, which we realize may not be the same as what you believe is the cause. So let's take a look at the results. Okay, so it looks like almost half, uh, and you could have chosen more than one, almost half of hereditary pancreatitis, and the others, number two is not sure, which is actually pretty typical. So we have actually a very good, um, diverse set of potential causes or etiologies here, and we may learn during this webinar that the causes may not be as different as people think. Uh, so... Now, uh, Mission Cure is deploying several coordinated strategies to develop effective treatments. And what we're going to do is invest, raise, raise funding from impact investors and invest in a whole portfolio of projects and companies to improve and lengthen the lives of people with pancreatitis. And we also have a pancreatitis patient advocacy and education program. Uh, and this webinar is part of that program. 
We've gotten tremendous support from the National Pancreas Foundation and really the whole scientific community as we work toward the cure. So please feel free to email Linda or me if you'd like to learn more and let us know if you're interested in helping or even potentially investing in some of the projects we're developing. So now let's move on to our feature presentation. I am thrilled to announce Dr or to introduce Dr. David Whitcomb. Um, you can see his impressive academic credentials on the slide, but what the slide doesn't say is that Dr. Whitcomb is the one who discovered the genes that are associated with pancreatitis, and he is the world's leading expert in applying a precision medicine approach to treating pancreatitis and other diseases as well. So we're happy to have him on our webinar. Dr. Whitcomb? Thank you, uh, Megan and Linda. Uh, we are so excited about Mission Cure. Uh, it is uh, a missing piece of the puzzle, and together we are very enthusiastic about the opportunities to make a big difference. So I've spent my life studying the pancreas and trying to find a cure, and the first thing I'd like to talk about briefly is uh, to answer the question, what does the pancreas do? Bite into a lemon and think about what's happening as you're biting on a lemon. This gives us a little bit of idea of what the digestive glands in your body do. The salivary glands are leaping into action when you bite a lemon. And many of you felt these secretions into your mouth. And uh, one of the secretions is bicarbonate and it neutralizes citric acid. Another component of this fluid coming from the salivary glands are enzymes that digest complex carbohydrates and breaking them down into sugars. And so what you feel is the sourness slowly goes away and the release of the sugars from the complex carbohydrate makes the lemons taste sweet. Now the pancreas is a gland similar to your salivary glands that, less, that uh, rest immediately behind the stomach. And what it does is secretes bicarbonate into the first part of the small intestines that mixes with gastric acid coming out of the stomach to neutralize it. And the gastric acid and the bicarbonate make salt water, which is perfect for digestion. It also secretes enzymes to digest the entire meal, not just carbohydrates. And most of the enzymes that it secretes which are like small biological scissors, uh, are to digest meats. Thirdly, the pancreas has another function in that when it is signaled to digest a meal, it releases insulin into the bloodstream, which is a uh, messenger to go to the cells and say, sugars are on the way from the digestive tract, pull them out of the bloodstream and into the cells and use them for energy and for building the things that the cell needs. And so the pancreas plays a key role in the digestion of foods, but it functions in a way similar to the salivary glands. So in the top right, you can see a diagram of the pancreas. It's uh, shaped uh, secreting into the intestine on the uh, left corner. The pink circle is the first part of the intestine, the duodenum, and at the top is the where the stomach should be, the stomach had to be cut away to show the pancreas because it is in the very back of the abdomen. The problem with it being in the back of the abdomen is it makes it extremely difficult for physicians to study because you can't touch it or feel it and it is protected from the environment. That's actually good for the patient because the pancreas is very sensitive to injury for reasons I'll talk about. What is pancreatitis? Pancreatitis is the inflammatory response to injury. What happens is that the digestive enzymes that the pancreas makes becomes active. And the major enzyme is a protease. Pancreas means all protein. And so the pancreas can actually digest itself. And you can imagine what a horrible situation that is when a person's body literally begins to dissolve itself from the inside. What's even worse is that in some cases, the inflammation can spread to the whole body and activate inflammation everywhere, which can cause multiple organs to fail and even cause death. 
fortunately, modern medicine is able to intervene and with heroic efforts, uh, those patients that uh, are having organ failure uh, can be saved. The problem is, is that once you've had acute pancreatitis, there's a problem called recurrent acute pancreatitis. This means that you've basically had more than one episode of acute pancreatitis. But for reasons that are not understood, the first attack of acute pancreatitis changes the pancreas, making it hypersensitive to additional attacks. And so we are very concerned that something is happening in these patients and the ones that do develop recurrent attacks can have the entire pancreas destroyed. We call this chronic pancreatitis and it is the destruction of the pancreas due to recurrent or persistent inflammation. Older studies taught us that this was due to alcohol. And if you saw this destruction of the pancreas, the person had to be an alcoholic. But less than 5% of patients who are alcoholics actually develop pancreatitis. And what's more important and is not well understood by many physicians is that the new studies suggest that less than half of the patients have any alcohol at all and that the key is actually genetics. And we'd like to talk a little bit about the genetics of pancreatitis. Now, the first problem we have is the framework that all doctors are taught medicine. And that is a traditional definition of diseases based on the clinical features and what the organ looks like when the pathologists look at it under the microscope. And so here is what a normal pancreas looks like on the left. And you see it's kind of a dark purple. There is a, a pink uh, thing up in the right corner, and that is a big blood vessel, and those are muscles around it. And then you see some faint light gray spots, and those are the islets of Langerhans. Those are the cells that make insulin. And you can see they're floating in a sea of purple, which is the cells that make the digestive enzymes filled with protein that will be delivered to the intestine. Now, the second picture is mild pancreatitis. And what you see is these pink strands going everywhere. This is fibrosis or scarring. And these patients are now beginning to have the symptoms of chronic pancreatitis, but it's not until they finally develop a complete replacement of the pancreas by scar tissue that you have chronic pancreatitis. This is irreversible. There's nothing you can do to change this. And so the diagnostic criteria for chronic pancreatitis uh, is the destruction of the pancreas is shown here. And this is the one that most physicians continue to use today to diagnose chronic pancreatitis. You have to have irreversible damage. Well, this is difficult because it's irreversible. On a clinical side, we see that uh, patients have a variety of features. Now, many of them can be seen on a CAT scan, and this CAT scan shown on the right demonstrates a number of abnormalities that can be seen in the pancreas, which is that central object. In this CAT scan, it's the patient laying on their back, you're looking up and seeing on the left side the liver, the right side the spleen, at the bottom the white thing circle with the blotches or the kidneys, and the big white thing in the middle is the backbone, and the pancreas is right in the middle of the abdomen. On the left, we see the characteristics of these patients is quite variable. About 80% of them will have severe scarring, but 20% never have scarring. Some of them will have maldigestion where there's not enough enzymes produced to digest a meal, and yet 60% can manage. Diabetes mellitus, destruction of the islets, occurs in about 35%. Some people have pain, and the pain can be the worst and most debilitating pain ever, but about 20% of patients have limited or no pain at all. There's even five different types of pain. Who gets which type and why? Unpredictable. And there's a high risk of pancreatic cancer. About 15% of patients can develop uh, pancreatic cancer. And it was thought that patients with hereditary pancreatitis have up to a 40% chance of pancreatitis, but with interventions, it is now less than 7%. So how is the diagnosis traditionally made? It's made by demonstrating the irreversible damage. And since it's so hard to biopsy the pancreas and so dangerous, uh, we use CAT scans, MRI, ERCP, and endoscopic ultrasound as a surrogate for the tissue pathology 
and show there's irreversible damage, and now we make a diagnosis. Once you make a diagnosis at this advanced stage, the treatment is only symptomatic. We don't know where it came from. We don't know why one person got it and another didn't. So we treat the pain, but now there's a big push to limit narcotics, which is necessary for the severe pain. There's pancreatic enzyme replacement therapy that's very inconvenient and expensive, and insulin replacement if the islets of Langerhan have been destroyed. So currently, what do we have? We have a disease that is hopeless, irreversible, and expensive to diagnose and treat. This is completely unacceptable. 100 years of, of uh, experiments were done in order to understand what the pathology meant by looking under the microscope and studying patients with all these variabilities. And a study that was made 100 years after the discovery that pancreatitis was caused by autodigestion of the pancreas instead of infection came up with this conclusion using the traditional approach. Chronic pancreatitis remains an enigmatic process of uncertain pathogenesis, unpredictable clinical course, and unclear treatment. That's ridiculous. How can you spend 100 years and come up with a New England Journal of Medicine paper that basically says we have no idea who gets it, why they get it, and what's going to happen to them? And we don't know how to treat it. Now, consider a 33-year-old woman who doesn't drink alcohol, except maybe occasional glass now and then, who starts having pancreatitis-like pain. And now on a CAT scan, there is some new evidence that her pancreas is starting to scar. So she's looked on the internet, she sees what's coming, and she's afraid. And she has three questions for the doctor, and she comes to the world's expert, and she says, why me? What's going to happen to me? And what can I do to change the outcome of this disease that I look like I'm having? Fortunately, there's doctors that have spent their life studying this, and they use the tools that have been given to them and the education they have from years of medical training using the traditional approach. And what he says is, I don't know. I don't know what's going to happen to you, and I don't know what you can do to change the clinical course. This teaches us that the traditional medicine for complex disorders like chronic pancreatitis has failed. We have to have some new approaches. Now we talked briefly about genetics and I wanna give you just an update on the genetics. What we're trying to do is to force the genetics into traditional pathology-based medicine. Somehow look under the microscope and get a genetics report and have the pathologist tell us what to do. There's three major genes that we look at in Mendelian disorders. So these are genetic disorders that have a clear defined inheritance pattern. You know, it came from your parents and their parents and you know that which brothers and sisters have this disease. It's autosomal dominant like in hereditary pancreatitis or recessive like in cystic fibrosis. And it's caused by a single gene. It's often evidenced at birth or shortly thereafter and it has a unique, very well-defined features or phenotype, so we can describe what it is. And so here are the three major ones we look at. The CFTR gene causing cystic fibrosis, PRSS1 causing hereditary pancreatitis, and SPINK, which can cause a familial chronic pancreatitis. But there's some major limitations. First of all, 95% of pancreatitis cases are not Mendelian genetics, so they tell you gee, you don't, have a Mendele, you don't have a Mendelian disease. Most of the genetics don't fit into the pathology-based disease definition. You can't look under the microscope and understand what the genetics mean. There's just no connection there. And it's a little bit late. The genetics reports are also prepared by classic geneticists or pathologists, so they don't really understand what the patients are struggling with, with their disease, they're just looking at the pathology if they can get it, or the CAT scan if they can't. There's no framework for understanding susceptibility genes, modifying genes, environmental factors, or other things that we know play a major role in the disease and its manifestations. These give very limited insight into patient management. And on top of that, the physicians 
lack the tools to understand complex genetics and implement them in clinical practice. And so even though we know genetics is important, in the traditional method, we don't know what to do. A new approach is needed. Fortunately, the new approach is here. And what I'd like to tell you is that as a community, we have to change from the traditional approach that was established by Louis Pasteur and based on looking at germs and single factors to precision medicine that uses information and genetics and clinical features in order to tie the things together to find out what's going on with an individual person and answer the question, why me? What's going to happen to me? And how can I stop it? So let's look at the differences uh, briefly here between the past and the future. So the past is the Western medicine. The future is precision medicine. The definition of chronic pancreatitis is irreversible damage, but now it's what is the response to injury. If you have an injury to the pancreas, is it going to heal and get better or not? And if not, why? The disease model is different. It's not a germ that's causing it. It's dysfunction of a complex system. The etiology, we know it's not one factor such as alcohol. It's multiple factors. None of them are necessary or sufficient but in the right combinations in an individual person, it can cause disease. The diagnosis in the past is made on pathology. In the future, it's on genetic risk factors, the clinical settings and biomarkers, so we know who's getting the disease and whether or not our treatments are stopping it. Importantly, the time to diagnosis, five to 10 years before you can make a diagnosis of irreversible disease, but in precision medicine, you can get the diagnosis in one month. You know exactly what it is and what's gonna happen. The use of genetics in the traditional is not necessary. Now it's central. It is central to understanding these diseases. The treatment goals in the past were try to relieve the symptoms and we usually fail. But now we can prevent disease. The effectiveness of the traditional approach was generally poor, but we're hoping for an outstanding future. So now, Groups like Mission Cure can start linking the right medicine to the right patient because we understand who has what and what to do about it. Now, the other thing that's interesting is that there's a new progressive model that we understand from epidemiology. So there's a link between acute pancreatitis, recurrent pancreatitis, and chronic pancreatitis. This is an illustration for alcoholic pancreatitis, but it holds true for other types of pancreatitis as well. What we learn is the progression happens over time, and it's at different rates in different people depending on the combination of factors and whether or not they're taking the right medicines. So we have time between when the diagnosis is made and when we intervene and we can predict what's gonna happen and see whether or not our interventions stop the progression to a horrible disease. So now what we have done as a community is redefined pancreatitis as a progressive disorder of inflammation, and we have five stages. First of all, people are at risk. So these are individuals who have a lot of bad genes, but nothing's happened. And then for some reason, injury occurs, and they end up with an episode of acute pancreatitis. And this stage is important because this is where the pancreas changes and becomes very sensitive. Now, only in a subset of patients, as you remember, uh, go from acute pancreatitis to recurrent acute pancreatitis and early chronic pancreatitis. And this is a, a very important stage because now it is undiagnosable because it's not irreversible. If it's irreversible, then it's not early. But this is a stage that can last for five years and it's an important stage that we wanna be thinking about. Now with established pancreatitis, you begin having irreversible damage and we watch the patient until the organ is destroyed. What we understand is that we need to make our diagnosis and treatment earlier. We need to diagnose in stage B, C, and D, apply treatments in those stages. And this can only be done with precision medicine because we can make an early diagnosis based on the combination of factors, not on a single factor. Once this occurs, we can make a, an effective treatment, monitor the patient, and now if you want to know what end-stage pancreatitis looks like, you have to look in a history book because we want to eliminate this forever. Now this is for doctors, and I just want to give you a brief overview. The TIGER-O is just an acronym for all the different factors 
that can be classified that can mix together in different ways to cause disease, and one of them is genetics. What you see is there's a whole variety of different mechanisms of disease, and each one of them causes end-stage scarring for a different reason. The interventions are very important because we want to stop the progression from the mechanism to end-stage disease, and the different colors means they require a different treatment. How do you know which person gets which one? That is what precision medicine does. It tells you what the mechanism is, it tells you what the process is, and it tells you the right medicine to block this. And working with our partners, we want to begin to understand how to do this. So to summarize my uh, talk, we want to have the best treatment. Even though there's multiple causes, there's one right treatment for the patients, we want to find out what it is. We know from this talk and from many papers that have been published that Western medicine has failed. It can't answer, why me? What's gonna to happen to me and what can I do to change it? A new framework such as precision medicine is required, but as you saw from the last slide, it's pretty, it's pretty complex. Physicians can't understand all the genetics and all the mechanisms and impute everything in their head, especially within two or three minutes. So new tools are needed at the point of care that allows precision medicine to work. And we believe the future is now. We need to go from precision genetics to precision medicine. And this is what is necessary to change this disease forever. Now, when the precision medicine initiative came out, uh, one of the Harvard experts said, there's really only 10 things we need to do to achieve precision medicine that we don't have now. As you look at this list, a lot of things are linking the health records and making sure the data is correct and that people consent to what's happening to their data and that we measure over time, is the patient getting better or not? We have to update the information. We need to use computers with real-time support. It has to be affordable. And we have to have all ethnic and ancestral backgrounds represented. But the last one is what I wanna to bring to your attention. We need to educate health workers. And basically, if you tell doctors, here's what to do and why they can do it. If you ask them to become a geneticist, it's not gonna happen. But more importantly, they point out that in many instances, patients will be the precision medicine experts because to them, this is personal. They want to track what's going on and they wanna be able to tell their story and to use it to help others and themselves. How can they connect to all this information? How can they connect to their genetics? How can they pull all these things together? Well, there's an important new invention that's available, and everybody on this call has one. It's called a smartphone, and we can use smart technology to link the pieces together, bypass the bureaucracy, and for the first time, achieve precision medicine in our lifetime. And with that, I want to thank you for your attention and appreciate the opportunity to tell you why we're excited about what's happening in pulling all the pieces together and why partnerships are critical for success. Thank you, Dr. Whitcomb. You can see that he really has a vision for what the future should look like. And it may seem um, kind of big and overwhelming, but actually that's the way our, our healthcare and medicine system is going and we're lucky that we have Dr. Whitcomb who is at the forefront of that who really cares about pancreatitis and so this is uh, this is happening now and uh, we'll only get better into the future. So now it's time for our second poll. If you are a chronic or a, a pancreatitis patient or caregiver, have you or your child had genetic testing? For pancreatitis, so not including 23andMe or other general genetic testing, yes or no? And if you have had genetic testing for pancreatitis, how many genes did they test for? One, two to four, five or more, or you don't know? We'll learn that there are several different types of genetic tests, um, so it'll be interesting to, to have the answers to these questions. Let's take a look. Sixty-nine percent of the people on this webinar have had genetic testing. Um, that's that's great, and 
the majority of the people do not know how many genes were tested for. Um, you'll, you'll learn a bit about that in a minute. The ones that test for five or more are the more recently developed ones and they can provide some more information. Um, so now I would like to introduce Dr. Mark Haupt. Um, there we go. Uh, Dr. Haupt practiced as a pediatric pulmonologist who treated children with cystic fibrosis, including many children with chronic pancreatitis. And now he's the chief medical officer of Aerial Precision Medicine, which is a genomics and digital health company delivering precision medicine solutions for pancreatitis and other complex disorders. So thank you, Dr. Haupt, for joining us. Thank you for the introduction, Megan, and uh, Linda and Megan, thanks for the opportunity to be a part of this. And Dr. Wickham, that was a fantastic introduction and your enthusiasm is infectious. And I hope uh, everyone was motivated by all of your insights and the work that you've done throughout your career. So, so thank you for that overview. I'd like to introduce you um, to Danny Bissett. And this is a little bit of a story about cystic fibrosis. And as Megan mentioned, my background is in the pediatric pulmonology space. Obviously, cystic fibrosis is close to my heart. Um, at the age of four, Danny donned the cover of Science Magazine. And the reason was is that he was the individual in whom they used his blood sample to identify the genetic defect at the, at the heart of cystic fibrosis, the CFTR gene. Prior to this discovery, it was recognized that cystic fibrosis happened in families. So there was a familial pattern to it. There was an inheritance to it, but they weren't exactly sure what it was. But in this journal, they re reported the results of, the, of this finding that the CFTR gene was in fact the cause of cystic fibrosis. And this was an important day. And this was an eight-year-old who wrote in her journal this day, today is the most best day in my life, ever in my life. They found a gene for cystic fibrosis. And the reason this is so important, that in 1989, they realized there was a genetic etiology or cause for the disease, that now, after an incredible scientific boom, we've realized that there are over 2,000 different variations in the cystic fibrosis gene that have been discovered. Only about 200 of those actually cause disease, but we've been able to classify them into five or six, some say seven, different groups. These different groups are important because they explain what is actually happening with the CFTR protein based on what the underlying defect or variant is. And the reason that that is important is that in this time period, since 1989, there's been incredible drug discovery in this space. And there are now three FDA approved therapies that are available on the market for cystic fibrosis that are targeted at the basic defect, the CFTR protein, and are based on specific genetic variants. So this truly is precision medicine in action. And what you can see down that entire list, the ones at the top of the check marks are the approved therapies. All those other arrows are additional products that are currently in different phases of drug development. So this demonstrates the importance of understanding the genetic mechanisms of a disease so that potentially there is the opportunity to identify therapeutic targets. So what do we know about cis, uh, uh, pancreatitis? So in 1996, Dr. Wickham and his group reported the uh, PRSS1 gene as a cause of hereditary pancreatitis. Similar to what was seen in the cystic fibrosis community, there was a familial pattern to pancreatitis. It was running in families, it was occurring at young age. So there had to be something there. And they discovered the PRSS1 gene and that it caused an abnormal regulation of trypsin, which is an enzyme in the, in the pancreas, which as Dr. Wickham described, the pancreas basically eats itself. And at that time in 1996, Dr. Wickham wrote, no rational or effective preventive strategies have been developed and treatment consists solely of supportive care. So that was pancreatitis then. And so the PRSS1 R122H was the variant or the mutation that was discovered. The PRSS1 is the gene, the R1, R122H is the change that occurs. So it's the one, the number is the location at which the change occurs and the change, those letters are the amino acid changes. And these are important because as you will see, these different changes, even within a gene, mean different things to physicians, to geneticists, to genetic counselors, um, to anyone who's working in this space. So not only is it important to know which gene in which the variant is occurring, 
but which variant is it specifically because they behave differently. And so this is important. So that was in 1996. Now we know all of these different genes are involved with pancreatitis. And there are still more that we're still discovering. So this list continues to change. And not only is it just the list of genes that changes, it's the variance within each of these genes and our understanding of those variants that changes is not only the technology um, changes within genetic testing, but the more people that get tested, we start to understand the relationship between the underlying genetics, the mechanism, and the phenotype or the clinical picture that a patient may have based on what their genotype is. So this is again important because we can start to break things down into different groups. And this helps us understand what role genetics might have in pancreatitis. As Dr. Wickham mentioned, there are Mendelian disorders such as cystic fibrosis or hereditary pancreatitis such as, a, as are caused by the PRSS1 gene or the familial pancreatitis caused by SPINK1. Those we know are really associated with classic forms of pancreatitis. I use that term loosely. But we're now learning there are other uh, disease modifying genes, such as in the calcium sensing receptor, the CASR, the GGT1 um, pathway, which helps with stress or the way your body reacts to stress in its cells. And these may not just cause pancreatitis by themselves, but if you get pancreatitis, they may make your disease worse, or they may make the progression from acute pancreatitis to recurrent acute pancreatitis to chronic pancreatitis more rapid or make you more susceptible to certain of those end-stage features that Dr. Wickham described. So again, we're starting to be able to describe and understand where these different genetic pieces come into play for each individual. And again, going back to mechanism, and these terms aren't necessarily important, but what I'm trying to show here is that we're really starting to understand the basic um, premise in the biology and the cellular biology of pancreatitis using genetics. We're understanding where in the cell, where in specific metabolic pathways or different cell signaling pathways in the, in, the, in the pancreas, or even different enzymes or processes that are occurring. We're starting to know exactly where these genes play a role, exactly which variants do what in this process. And this is helping us to understand, to predict what a patient may have, what outcomes they may have, what the progression may likely be, and again, what potential therapeutics may be available or may be available in the future through drug discovery. Now, genetic testing has boomed in the recent years. And you can see this graph here from the genetic testing registry that from 2012 to 2018, you can see the number of different conditions that have increased. Those are those red bars. So those are all the different diseases that now have genetic testing available, the number of genes that are available in the green bars, and then look on the bar graph on the right with the blue bars. Those are the number of different tests that are now available. Over 50,000 different genetic tests are available. So you might be saying, well, which one is right for me? And how do I know which one should I should use? Or what, what's the appropriate one for pancreatitis? So first we need to consider is who should get testing? And really genetic testing now is it's, is it's so available. It can be for anyone who's really trying to understand more about the progression of their disease, the disease itself, the cause of pancreatitis, is it familial patterns? Really anyone that's seeking more information. You know, many patients um, are unfortunately labeled as having alcoholic pancreatitis when they may in fact have idiopathic pancreatitis. As Dr. Wickham mentioned, it takes a significant amount of alcohol to cause chronic pancreatitis. You have to drink about a six pack per day for about five years to develop chronic pancreatitis from alcohol alone. The other items that I have listed here in terms of recurrent acute pancreatitis with uncertain cause, early onset, which is typically less than 25 years of age, these are things that are out there that are in the published literature as suggestions or guidelines in whom to consider testing. But really, it's available for anyone. So which test to consider? Not all pancreatitis genetic testing panels are the same, and we saw that in the poll. Some individuals were tested for one gene, and there may be a specific reason for that, that they know there's a specific gene change or variant that's present in a family, so they tested just for that one. Some commercial testing laboratories only test for the PRSS1 gene. Other testing laboratories test up to five genes, 12 genes. Some include genes that are related to lipid metabolism, so how your body handles cholesterol, um, which is a risk factor for pancreatitis. As you can imagine, is there all these different genes that are available? I really want to stress the importance of genetic counseling in this process. Before any genetic test is undertaken, you should really receive thorough genetic counseling to understand which test is appropriate, 
what the results might mean, what they'll mean for your family, and where to get additional resources. So if you do get testing, what do the results mean? Again, I'm making a point here, genetic counseling is important. And the reason that their genetic counselors are important in addition to your care providers is that the results of the test have to be understood in the clinical context. That means what are your symptoms? What is your family history? What are your medications are you on? What does your CT scan look like? What laboratory findings do you have? All of that information really has to go into the interpretation of your DNA sequencing. There are a number of different possible results that are available. You can have a positive report, a negative one, an inconclusive one, or unexpected. Positive means we found something, that there's a change in one of your genes that could be associated with your pancreatitis. And that could be either pathogenic, such as the CFTR Delta F508 variant, which is the most common one that causes cystic fibrosis, or the PRSS1 R122H, which causes hereditary pancreatitis. Ones that might be pathogenic that we're learning more about and ones that are risk, those minor ones that change your, the chances of having pancreatitis or the progression that I mentioned. A negative one means there's a normal change there. You're not gonna see those results. Inconclusive variant means we found something but we don't yet know what it means. We need more information. We need more patients who are tested to understand what it means because we haven't seen it before. There's maybe mixed data, we're not sure or unexpected, meaning we found something in a different gene that isn't related to your pancreatitis, but may be important for a different disorder. For example, the ApoE4 gene, there is, it is associated with a form of high cholesterol, but it's also associated with early onset dementia and Alzheimer's disease. This would be an additional or potentially unexpected finding that you weren't looking for as you're looking for answers for your pancreatitis. So how do you get tested? Talk to your provider. You need to understand which test might be important or helpful for you, what it's going to mean for you, knowing which test is the right one for you, understanding there are limitations to testing. Sometimes genetic variants may not be found, and that doesn't mean that's a negative result. It means that there just isn't an um, answer at this point in time, or our scientific understanding isn't there to, to have that answer, but things can change. Understand what the risks and benefits are. This can be very impactful for you understanding your family's medical history as well, and a variety of other things. So it's important to have an in-depth conversation with your provider as well as a genetic counselor. So that was a very quick overview, but I thank you for your attention and I'm always happy to answer any questions and I'm looking forward to uh, the discussion after this. So again, Megan and Linda, thanks for the opportunity to share some information today. Thank you very much, Dr. Haupt. And I see we have uh, several questions coming in. Um, I had a slide here that was some key takeaways, uh, but I think that what we'll do is let's go straight to the questions here. And we have our first question, uh, Andy, how much does genetic testing cost is it, and is it covered by insurance? And related to that, there's somebody on this webinar who whose uh, GI tried to get her tested uh, for genetic pancreatitis and her insurance denied it even with an appeal saying it was too dangerous with unknown outcomes. So uh, can you comment on that please? Yeah, um, so genetic testing, it will vary in terms of cost from lab to lab as well as the variants that are tested. Certainly the sequencing is, the cost of the actual sequencing is going down. And so really the cost is related to the interpretation, the analysis and the presentation of the report in terms of the clinical context and turning it from a genetic test into an actual clinically actionable report. Generally testing costs anywhere between two to $5,000. Again, there's variability in some labs will do four genes for close to $5,000. Some will do one, some will do less. It, it, so it's, uh, I'm not gonna speak to specific laboratories. Insurance uh, generally will cover it. It takes some effort and it varies depending on the plan, the payer, uh, a variety of different things. Usually where there's a challenge is it's educating the payer about the importance of the testing and how it will change management after the testing is done. Um, that's always a question that's related to genetic testing is what will the changes in clinical, clinical decision-making be afterwards? Um, but uh, we work at our, um, at our group, we work very hard with patients and the providers to work with the payer to do the best we can to get as much, that much, as much, as much coverage as we can, excuse me. 
Is that something that people could follow up with you about afterwards if they want advice on how to, to kind of try to persuade their insurance provider? Sure, absolutely. Okay, uh, terrific. Uh, there are several questions relating to PRSS1 mutations. Two questions uh, ask about why uh, hereditary pancreatitis seems to get worse generation to generation. Uh, can one of you address that, please? I'm going to defer to Dr. Wickham since he discovered the gene for it. Uh, this is a very important question. And the process of uh, the age of onset getting younger and younger is called anticipation. And there are some diseases in which this is very clearly uh, seen. And there was some concern that we were seeing this in hereditary pancreatitis. We just did a 20 year follow-up of the original uh, group of patients that we had uh, first uh, come in contact with and, and found the gene for hereditary pancreatitis. And we're able to look at them in a very systematic way. And the analysis showed that there was no anticipation overall. Within the group, there were some cases where the age of onset from a grandparent to a parent to a child seemed to be younger and younger, but there were cases in which the opposite occurred as well. And so the, the reason that there appears to be this uh, anticipation uh, is probably due to, to a variety of outside factors as well. Contributing to that is something called uh, detection bias, and that means that, uh, you know, 30 years ago, it was extremely hard to diagnose chronic pancreatitis, but with a greater awareness, with genetic testing, with very sensitive imaging technology, now we can diagnose it earlier in the course of disease. And so uh, the age of diagnosis is younger just because our detection is better. But the concern about it actually starting at a younger age uh, turns out to be uh, just a random uh, thing that we would see. In some cases, it looks like it's younger and younger, and others it may be older and older. But overall, uh, fortunately, we're not seeing that. Well, we have two kind of related questions. Uh, one from Christine that that say, um, "I have a uh, PRSS1 R122H mutation, and my child does too, but my child doesn't have any symptoms yet. Should you do you recommend any lifestyle changes? Yeah, so that's a great question, and this is one of the most exciting things that we saw in following up the patients uh, over the last 20 years, and we just published this recently. Um, when we first studied hereditary pancreatitis, we saw that the uh, risk of pancreatic cancer was increased uh, in, these, in this group. Almost 40% of patients were developing pancreatic cancer, and it seemed to be lo uh, linked to smoking. When the patients learned this and stopped smoking, uh, and then we followed them for 20 years, the rate of pancreatic cancer plummeted, and it's now less than 7%. And there are some people that still smoke, and it, it's uh, probably a little higher than you would expect in the, in the general population, but it shows that lifestyle can make a big difference. The second thing is that there uh, are patients that go for their entire lifetime that never have an episode of pancreatitis ever. Almost 20% of them just carry the gene, but nothing happens. We don't know why that is, and uh, obviously very interested in finding it. The third thing is that there are things that we have no control over that can trigger pancreatitis. There are certain types of viruses that can trigger it, uh, like the Coxsackie B virus. Uh, there are accidents can happen, falling on a handlebar of a bicycle that punches the stomach and hits the pancreas, or other uh, things that can happen. And so once that happens, the, the disease can be triggered at any age. Um, what we recommend is a healthy lifestyle, good exercise, uh, keep away from things that are too traumatic, um, and uh, just enjoy uh, life and recognize that there's a chance that uh, nothing will happen. In the meantime, those of us that have dedicated our careers to finding cures are working so that 
hopefully we'll be able to provide something in the future that will prevent the development of this disease. Thank you. And I just recently learned about the association with Kotsaki virus as well. Is there a vaccine for that that people could um, could get? Uh, I'm going to ask Mark uh, to, uh, I don't know of any, and uh, that's really something that uh, is more in pediatrics than taking care of older people like I do. No, it's a very common virus that's out there. And it's, you know, there are a number of different viruses that can lead to an episode of, of pancreatitis. Um, some of which are have um, vaccines or vaccine preventable, um, but uh, Coxsackie is not one of them. Um, I just wanted to add one point to what Dr. Wickham was mentioning about you know some just because you have variants may not always equal having disease, and that's something called penetrance. Um, and with hereditary pancreatitis, about um, the penetrance or the percentage of people who have a variant that have the disease or hereditary pancreatitis is about eighty percent. Um, at least what we've seen. Um, and so about 20% of people who have that variant won't have it. And again, for those various reasons, we're still still learning and trying to figure that out. Um, so I think uh, all the recommendations that Dr. Wickham made are, are spot on. Okay. And we have many, many questions. So I think we're going to have to try to go through them quickly and respond to them as quickly as possible. Here's one. I had an acute attack out of nowhere and was hospitalized for two days. My dad died of pancreatic cancer. Is there a link? Yeah, so that's a, a very important question. And it turns out that uh, there is a link, but it's a very weak link. So that if you've had an episode of acute pancreatitis, uh, there is a little bit higher risk of pancreatic cancer. And what I would recommend is just, uh, like I said, a healthy lifestyle and um, uh, those types of things. And we continue to work every day to learn if there are other things to pay attention to. But uh, there is a link, but it's very, very weak. And uh, another question, how many genetic mutations do people typically have? This, uh, one of our listeners that has uh, been found to have three different mutations. Is that unusual? That's a great question. And uh, what we will say is the younger you are when you get pancreatitis, the more likely you have multiple factors coming together at the same time. And um, it's, it's a random mix, but uh, you know, sometimes it's the perfect uh, horrible storm for some people. Uh, we've seen five or six uh, significant variants in, in one person uh, before. So uh, it does happen, and it usually indicates a younger age of onset. Mark? Yeah, I'd agree with that. Um... You know, commonly you'll see in patients who have the classic hereditary pancreatitis, they likely just have the PRSS1, R122H, or one of the other versions of the, the, the genes, variants associated with hereditary pancreatitis. But the, the comp, the, where we see the complex disorder, where we see more genes involved, it could be two different genes, three different genes, four or five, we've seen six. Sometimes there may be, uh, you know, particularly with the CFTR gene, you can have multiple variants within that gene. So we'll see patients that have three variants in CFTR, one in the PRSS1-2 loci, clot in two variants, and a SPINK1 variant. That's not atypical. So now I think we're going to do two more questions. One person asks, uh, what about non-genetic causes like gallbladder removal and sphincter of OD disorders? And I think there's a couple related questions that say, well, I've been told my pancreatitis is caused by X. Is it still um, worth having genetic testing? Could there also be a genetic cause? Good questions. Um, so first of all, the most common cause of acute pancreatitis is gallstones. And what is recommended is that as soon as possible after your first attack, you should have the gallbladder removed or have the sphincter of OD opened. Uh, there was a huge amount of interest in sphincter of OD dysfunction. That is the uh, sphincter that guards the pancreas and the gallbladder. Uh, it turns out that that is probably not um, a major problem and more pancreatitis is caused by trying to treat it than by the disease itself. Uh, the One of the diagrams I showed, there's at least um, you know, a dozen different things that can cause pancreatitis, but uh, usually your body is pretty resilient to it unless you have an underlying disorder, an underlying genetic disorder. 
Great. And then there are a number of questions that uh, essentially say, basically, I'm told that there's nothing further that can be done. And all I can do is take an en enzyme regimen and pain prescriptions. And <laughs> is there anything that we can do? And I think that um, it would be great to have your comments on that. But then that is a nice lead in actually to my wrap up and what Mission Cure is doing to try to use this information to develop effective therapy. So I'll give each of you just one minute or 30 seconds to respond to that. Yeah, this is a very important question. The National Institutes of Health, the FDA, Mission Cure, uh, National Pancreas Foundation, academic centers, uh, aerial precision medicine, and others met in Pittsburgh last summer. We all came together and said we have never been able to diagnose pancreatitis early, so we've never been able to intervene. But now that we have new tools, we can figure out that uh, there are ways of treating these diseases. And so uh, there are plans to enroll patients uh, at all stages of disease to get genetic testing, to organize them, and to begin systematically picking the best drug and, and testing whether or not we can prevent the development of this terrible disease. Yeah, I completely agree. And as a, just a corollary story, I, I remember being, when I was still in practice in clinic, an eight-year-old boy came to me, just had a diagnosis of cystic fibrosis, and his mother handed me a genetic testing report and said, is there anything you can do? And if it had been six months earlier, I would have said no. But that day I said, yes, there's a medication that is, can be prescribed exactly for your son's variants. And that was the Vertex drug. It was just FDA approved at that time. This was a few years ago. And there was something we can do. And so part of understanding this and, and understanding the genetics, um, you know, for some there may not be uh, opportunities now, but in the future, hopefully there will be. And we're certainly all working hard towards that. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Haupt and Dr. Whitcomb. Uh, we really appreciate your participation and sharing your expertise with us. I know there are some unanswered questions and Mission Cure will um, do our best to answer them and either post them on our website or get back to you uh, shortly about that. And before we wrap up, I just uh, want to say a little bit about what we at Mission Cure are doing with um, our presenters and other partners to try to develop effective therapies. One thing that um, I think uh, Dr. Halp might have alluded to is for people with CFTR mutations, um, we're looking into whether some existing drugs, some existing cystic fibrosis drugs can be uh, what they call repurpose can be applied to actually treat the chronic pancreatitis. So that's, that's one thing. And then right now, there is a competition of data scientists going on internationally to see who can use big data and artificial intelligence to identify therapies for chronic pancreatitis that's driven by genetic mutations. And this is sponsored by an alliance of pharmaceutical companies called the Pistoia Alliance and a company called Elsevier. And they chose Mission Cure and chronic pancreatitis as a subject of their competition. So we'll see what they come up with in the first quarter of 2019. Um, I want to let you know that we have two upcoming webinars and more to come. So please save the date and you can actually register for the next one now. And that's when we'll go into greater detail about Mission Cure's strategy. Um, and finally, we really hope that you'll join our effort. Please feel free to reach out to us and uh, let your friends know about future webinars. And also, please give us your input. You'll get a short evaluation in an email after the webinar. And please take a few minutes to fill it out because we want these to be as useful as possible for you. Thank you very much for participating in today's Mission Cure webinar and goodbye.